It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and I understand I've got quite a mixed audience. Uh, so maybe I should find out. So there are still four people coming up the stairs. But uh, so who's from the gravity, quantum gravity group? How many people are there? OK. And obviously particle physics, presumably as everyone else. And cosmology, cosmology. So, so I'm not sure what, you know, I want this talk to be useful. And fundamentally, I think what I have to say is um, it's not hard to understand. So if you're not understanding it, then I'm probably doing something wrong. So what I do recommend is that if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Um, and it's, yeah, so don't, yeah, please don't be afraid to ask questions. So the work is going to be about um, uh, trying to understand black hole thermodynamics from a microscopic point of view, which is, of course, one of the pastimes of people who think about quantum gravity. Um, and in particular, I said in the title, uh, from the perspective of Super Yang Mills, and the reason is because I usually think about this, con this problem in the context of uh, ADS-CFT and its generalizations. But Pretty much, uh, depending on how much time I have, I can say almost nothing about super young mills at all, and you can just phrase the story from the point of view of gravity or supergravity. Um, so perhaps I'll try and angle things that way. So don't worry if, uh, if you're not so familiar with super young mills. Um, the details of that uh, need not be important for this talk. Uh, so I should mention the work I'm going to talk about could be found in these papers, but in, in collaboration with uh, Takashi Morita, who's a postdoc in Kentucky, he wasn't Keck, he's just moved there, Shotaro Shiba, who's a postdoc in Keck, and Ben Withers, uh, who was at Durham and has moved to Southampton now. And so the plan for the talk is this. I'll, I'll give a very, very brief introduction to the thermodynamics of certain black holes and the role they play in understanding Yang mills certain Yang mills theories. And then I'm going to, so that's by way of motivation, but then I'm going to sort of take a step back and talk about um, an effective microscopic description of certain black holes. So unfortunately, this won't be the Schwarzschild black hole, but it won't be very far removed from a Schwarzschild black hole. These will be black holes and supersymmetric theories. And we'll be interested in uh, black holes that are at finite temperature. So in supersymmetric theories, it's possible to have extremal black hole solutions with no temperature, zero surface gravity horizons. But we'll actually be interested in finite temperature ones. And these will have some thermodynamics associated with that finite temperature. And the aim here is to write down an effective microscopic description where we'll be describing this black hole in terms of a large number of elementary constituents um, that don't live in a theory naively that has a metric and gravi a dynamical gravity. And what I'm going to try and argue is that if you think about putting this microscopic effective theory at finite temperature, the thermodynamics it would exhibit would precisely reproduce the thermodynamics of the black holes you're interested in. Now, as you are going to see, I'm going to have to wave my hands, because this theory will turn out to be strongly coupled. Um, and so I'm not going to be able to do a precise calculation. So if you want precise numbers, you're going to have to leave now, I'm afraid, uh, so as not to waste any more time. Uh, however, the hand-waving is so simple um, that I hope it will convince you there's some reason to believe it. it's plausible. And if I have time and, and people are interested, then I will uh, then relate this. So this is just a gravitational discussion, and I will relate this back to the original problem of Yang mill theory, and in particular tell you how this microscopic effective theory that I'm going to Sort of, I can motivate from a purely gravitational point of view, but I can much more precisely derive it uh, from uh, s certain super Yang mills theories, and thereby explain how it is that you can see black hole thermodynamics emerge in certain gauge theories, or at least that's uh, the picture. So let me start with the introduction and say a little bit more about that. So. Uh, maximally supersymmetric Yang Mills theories are very special. You can formulate them in uh, p space dimensions. So one plus p space dimensions is the is the 
this is the uh, case I'm going to think about. And um, via things analogous to the ADS-CFT correspondence, this work of Maldacena and collaborators, um, you can understand that this 1 plus p supiang mills theory in a certain limit called the decoupling limit, uh, or rather, it's supposed to describe the physics of brains or certain string theories which in the decoupling limit become a theory of uh, basically supergravity black holes. So let me tell you more precisely uh, what I mean by that. So we'll consider this theory at finite temperature because black holes are finite temperature objects, or at least the ones we're going to be interested in. There's some Lagrangian you can write down for your supersymmetric Yang-Mills theory, which will not be important for the, at least most of this talk. Um, suffice to say, we're going to think of it in Euclidean time. You would, you would write down the, this is the Euclidean version of the theory, and you would um, uh, have a periodic Euclidean time. You could imagine putting, trying to, you know, that uh, this is a perfectly well-defined field theory. It's got a gauge group, uh, which you could take to be UN, n is the number of colors, and then uh, the gauge field, and also because it's supersymmetric, you have additional scalar fields are uh, transformally adjoined to the gauge group, meaning they're n by n matrices. Okay. Now, one important point, uh, or a relevant point, is that the number of scalars you have is equal to the number of uh, transverse dimensions to 1 plus p dimensions in a 10-dimensional space. The point is that this theory, this 1 plus p dimensional theory, will be supposed to uh, it somehow encompass the physics of p brains, whose world volume is 1 plus p dimensional. And they live in 10 dimensions. They're some stringy object. And so the number of transverse dimensions they have is 10 minus 1 minus p, so 9 minus p. So there are 9 minus p of these scalar fields, which uh, may be relevant later. Something probably you may not be so familiar in thinking about is that the Yang-Mills coupling, whilst in three dimensions, is, is dimensionless, as we know from Maxwell theory, for example, or, uh, or uh, Yang, uh, you know, QCD. But in p dimensions, p spatial dimensions, it's dimension full, and its mass dimension is related to 3 minus p. When you're at large n, the natural coupling, uh, as you may have heard, is not really the Yang-Mills coupling. A more natural coupling is the Tuft coupling, which is related to it by a factor of n. And there's a natural, um, you know, when you put a theory at finite temperature, temperature is dimensional scale. Um, so the natural dimensionless coupling that you can construct is to take that temperature in units of your natural dimension full scale uh, in the theory, which is this uh, some power of this Tuft coupling. So there's a dimensionless temperature, which you can formulate from the actual temperature. And what this decoupling limit uh, boils down to from the point of view of the field theory is to say that you should consider a very large number of colors, a large rank of gauge group, and this dimensionless temperature you should keep to be of order one. So that's some Yang-Mills theory. You can write it down. And then the rather interesting or remarkable claim, well, how remarkable it is, I suppose, is the issue of this talk. But um, I, I, sorry, how big is... Well, p, could, p is the number of spatial dimensions. So in a, in a classic ADS-CFT correspondence, p is 3, because lambda is dimensionless. In that case, you can write, you can, uh, so don't worry that there's a 1 over 3 minus p. You just have to be slightly more careful. Um, but I could quite happily think about a quantum mechanical version of this theory where p is 0, or a 1 plus 1 version where it's p is 1, and so on. Well, there's 2 and then 3. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure how to think about whether they're hot or cold because you have to tell me. 
with respect to what? So, I mean, I suppose what I'm saying is they're precisely not hot or cold because the natural scale is lambda at large n. And so, precisely, they're neither too hot nor too cold. Let me say something slightly more about that. Yes. Uh, no, no. So, you have to be slightly careful. So, in this um, p equals 3 case, uh, you take n to infinity, keeping lambda constant and taking g angles to zero. But remember, in when p isn't 3, you see, let me just, as a slight aside, um, people are obsessed by the ADS-CFT case, which is p is 3, because you get a conformal symmetry and the dual gravity, blah, 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 blah. But from the point of view of quantum gravity, it's perhaps the more, most complicated and least interesting thing to look at. And there's a version of this correspondence which includes all the standard quantum gravity phenomenology, allegedly, assuming it's true and it's there, but that's just a quantum mechanics where p is zero. So to my mind, that's always the simplest setting to think about using holography to understand quantum mechanics. And I don't know why nearly everyone focuses on p equals 3, but I guess that's... Well, it, that's it. Yeah, and you can write down the fermions are uh, uh, simple. Yeah, indeed, it's, it's certainly known, that's right. Yes, yeah, sorry, this is maximally supersymmetric. So there are 16 real superchargers. So you, so you can think of this if you, if you know about super young mill theory. This is, the this is a classical dimensional reduction of n equals 1 in 10 dimensions. So it's a unique young mill theory there. Anyway, let me, let me go on and say oh, you may or may not find it remarkable, and for a long time I found it sort of remarkable, that if this whole gravity uh, string... Uh, sorry, gauge string duality proposal of Maldacena is correct, then the energy density in this theory is predicted to be the same as the energy density of some supergravity black hole. And in particular, we can write down supergravity black holes till the cows come home, and uh, when you do the analysis, this is the answer you would get. So this is the uh, dependence of the energy density in your theory for a general number of space dimensions p in terms of temperature, this tough coupling, uh, and n, and that's, that's the answer. So perhaps, um, and schematically, in terms of this dimensionless temperature, it's basically going like n squared. Now, n squared is not very surprising because fundamentally there are n squared degrees of freedom at high energies in this theory. The, the slightly peculiar thing is that the dimensionless temperature is going to some very peculiar power, 2 to the 7 minus p over 5 minus p. Now, maybe that's obvious to you, but to me, that was not. This is all at large n, yeah. yeah. This is in the usual uh, decoupling limit, yeah. Yes. It's, yes, I should say the expectation value of the energy density at finite temperature, so in the thermal state. Yeah. Yeah. So it's completely, yeah, I mean, it is, it's literally just a quantum field theory. You're putting it at finite temperature, and you're looking at the energy density. So you could look at the pressure. I mean, you could look at the VEV of the stress tensor and get, you know, whatever you want, but, yeah. Uh, well, they're not conformal, so there's no ADS, uh, okay. unless P is 3. But they live on something. There is some, yeah. The, so I'll write, I'll write down what they are, but... They are, so th they, yes, for those in the know, then the, uh, uh, and it won't be so important, but the, the supergravity dual of this that, it's, that you would get this from is a, a DP brain solution in the decoupling limit. So... So, it, so it, 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 it's this ADS5 cross S5 that you get an ADS CFT when P is 3, but in the other cases, it doesn't have an ADS geometry corresponding to the fact that there's no conformal symmetry in the yang mills theory. And there can't be because the coupling is dimensionful. Uh, well, I'll write down solutions later. Yeah, you can have a look and see. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, none of, the, none of the details of this are tremendously important, but I mean, they're interesting. <laughs> yes. 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 
Yes, so the supergravity black hole you should think of as arising from taking n dp brains, putting them all together, take a very large number, they strongly deform the geometry, you get some black hole solution from that with some charge determined just by n, um, and then you extract the sermon Um But the, the important point here is not... Uh, I mean, there's some gravity calculation you can do, but the important point is it's supposed to tell you about yang mills theory. Now, what you naively know about yang mills theory is confinement, deconfinement. You know, confinement doesn't, you know, confinement has a mass gap. Deconfined phases look sort of basically almost free. Um, this has a, has a very non-trivial temperature dependence. It's a power law, which is indicative of some infrared scaling dynamics, right, which is very... It's very difficult to understand where that comes from in the yang mills theory. In particular, for example, this power, 2, 7 minus p over 5 minus p. I defy you to see where that is in there. I mean, maybe there's, you know, it's not obvious. That's what I mean to say. Okay. In fact, there's an extra condition on the dimensionless temperature that it should be of order 1 and small so that the supergravity dual is good, but let's not worry too much about that. Um, the aim really is to understand how surprising is it, and what is the origin of this within that super Yang Mills theory? Yes? Uh, yes, well, okay, so let me say that's absolutely right. So let me say um, so Yang Mills theory as a Thinking of it as a, as a in, in terms of renormalization, is marginal in p is 3. It's super renormalizable in p less than 3. And it's non-renormalizable in p greater than 3. OK, so now, string theorists um, like to think that this, because of all the supersymmetry, these theories may still be well-defined in p greater than 3. So you can quite happily talk about d5 brains and d4 brains. These are believed to exist. And this sort of super yang mill theory is therefore believed to have some, so, some sort of completion as a good quantum field theory. But just strictly coming at it from a quantum field theory point of view, going above P as 3 is a little bit peculiar. You have to have some other evidence that it would make sense to do that. You don't normally write down non-renormalizable theories um, unless, you, you know, unless you understand cutoffs and so on. Well. Um, so let me just say P as 5 is... This, is, is um, yeah, is the, was related to the five brain, which is a very peculiar object, and certainly peculiar things happen at special values of p. But let's con let's concern ourselves with only p is three or less, and then nothing peculiar happens. And in particular, you might worry about uh, nothing peculiar happens in this in p is three if you take the limits carefully. Yeah, that's that's right. Okay. Yes, anyway, I mean... Let me just... Let me skip this in the interest of time, because I fear I have a train to catch at half past five. And now I've got a number of slides. So the idea is that that theory we just discussed is supposed to provide a fundamental microscopic description of some quantum gravity, at least in certain limits, it's a fundamental description of a quantum gravity that contains black holes whose thermodynamics behave like that. Okay, that's the claim. Um, there's been remarkably little study of directly trying to solve this theory because it's strongly coupled. So in particular, the regime of interest here where t is of order 1, in fact, t has to be of order 1 but small, um, the theory is strongly coupled. You're basically uh, in the in the in the you know temperature. In coming back to what you were saying, temperature being order one means it's not really big or small. But in fact, you've got to make it a little bit small. N's gone to infinity, but you've got to make this a little bit small in order for the supergravity to actually be valid. You get alpha prime corrections otherwise. And so, um, at low temperature, when you're in a super renormalizable theory, uh, you're in a strong coupling regime. Just like in quantum mechanics, the low temperature behavior of quantum mechanics is strongly coupled. The high temperature behavior is trivial. So there's been surprisingly little work trying to solve this theory, partly because 
uh, it's hard. It's very hard. It's strongly coupled. So I should point to um, this. There was some very nice old work now by Kabat, Lishitz, and Lowe a long time ago. Basically, you're trying to use mean field theory to just directly solve the thermal Yang-Mills theory in the case of P is zero, where it's just a quantum mechanics. And then more recently by Shi Ying and uh, Yin in Harvard. Um, and it's, it's very nice, um, somewhat complicated, and it doesn't seem to get the right answer, is the bottom line. Um, but it may well be possible to pursue it and get the right answer. A long time ago, I, uh, together with Simon Cattrall, tried to just put this theory on a lattice in the case of P equals zero. It's just quantum mechanics. How hard can it be? It turns out to be somewhat challenging. Um, and a group in uh, Keck, led by Jun Nishimura, did the same thing. And we, all, we both worked very hard. And we could see that the thermodynamics was coming out that was consistent with this. I, don't, I wouldn't say we had, you know, it's numerical calculations. So I don't, you know, I'm never going to prove this. Um, so it's Monte Carlo lattice. But, um, but the, the thing that struck me at the end of the day after working very hard for a long time and, is that if you believe the correspondence so what? You just showed that it's right, but no, no one's surprised. It would have been nice, I suppose, had we shown that it didn't agree. Um, but you don't, it's a black box. You don't gain any understanding for why this behavior came out. And so, that, so that's the motivation for trying to think about just a simple way to understand where the basics of, the, of that sort of uh, physics comes out. And in particular, I'm going to basically try and tell you by the end of the talk where all the stuff written in black, a simple way to understand how that arises. And I'm not going to have anything to say about the stuff written in violet. Uh, this is exact in the large N limit. Yeah. Yes. That's right. Yes, yeah, so there would be subleading corrections in N. It's also exact. Uh, in the t being small limit. So you take n to infinity, and then there are corrections in both 1 over n squared, but also in powers of, essentially, uh, there would be a power series in t starting with this power. Yeah, I mean, there's, yes, both things are at the same physical temperature. Yes, the gravity and the... Yes, and in, the de, you know, in all of this, in the decoupling limit, the brain is in some sense close to extremality and in some sense it isn't. And I can elaborate on that if you're interested. It depends from whose perspective you're asking. Um, so... Yes, it sounds trivial if you say it's in the, in the near extremal limit, because um, it sounds like it's not very hot. But uh, the physics that's being captured is sort of like, um, I mean, that's, the point is because these brains are rather special, because of this scaling symmetry, there's a lot of interesting physics that can happen even at low temperatures. So it's not at all trivial in that sense. And it's the reason that when, you, when people talk about ADS-CFT, if you take D3 brains, you take lots of them, the solution's asymptotically flat. It's not ADS cross something. It's asymptotically flat. But if you focus in on this decoupling limit, you focus in near where the brains are, you get this ADS region. And then from the point of view of that region, you're far from extremality. It's very far from extremality. Anyway, let me, carry, let me continue. So... Now let me not say any more about super young mills, probably till the very end of the talk. Let's talk about supergravity. Um, so supergravity has this generic form. I'm sure you're all uh, familiar with this. Uh, it, you have a dilaton, you have a form field. And if we want to couple our supergravity to P brains, this form field should be a 1 plus P dimensional form field. Um, there's some coupling here, which is uh, just um, sort of exponential coupling in this Einstein frame metric. And just for, to be clear, this is actually going to be in a general number of dimensions, d. If you were interested in string theory, this would probably d would be 10 or 11. But what I'm going to say is actually just more general than that. So we're going to take big d dimensions. Our brain will be 
uh, 1 plus p dimensional, including its time on the world volume. And so the number of transverse dimensions, in fact, which is the thing that plays the key role here, is d minus 1 minus p. And I'm going to call that n. And note that this solution includes black holes. I mean, I could take this to be four dimensional and p is zero. And then this solution includes black holes that look like, uh, well, it includes the Schwarzschild metric, but the ones we're going to be interested in are charged. And so they look a little bit like Reiser Nordstrom, except that they also have a scalar field. Okay, so not quite Reiser Nordstrom, but they're not far off. Now, uh, I can then couple brains to this, and if I'm consistent with the supersymmetry, that tells me, uh, the, it determines the, the way they couple uh, uniquely. And so the metric on the brains is the pullback, not actually of the Einstein frame metric, but of a metric, of the Einstein metric, scaled by this scalar, the dilaton, in some particular way. And then it also couples to the uh, vector to provide it, you know, they're, they're a charge source for this vector field, this gauge field, um, and so they couple by the pullback of the form field here. And then an elementary brain in this theory, I should have said that there's a coupling mu, which is in some sense a tension. It's not quite a tension, but it's something like a tension, and it determines, more importantly, it determines the charge of a brain. And the elementary charge, let me call it little q, or charge density, I should say, little q, is related then to mu. And kappa, kappa squared is 8 pi g newton. So it's just the newton constant. And so the number, if you give me a, um, a supergravity solution with charge, I can tell you how many elementary uh, brains would be needed to make that same charge. And it would be big N, which is the charge of the gravity solution divided by the elementary charge. So then the, then the idea now is to write down, we have these brains, these, these brains that can interact, these elementary brains, they're like particles, although they're extended in some di directions, and they can interact via graviton exchange, by the scalar and the vector exchange. And so the idea is to say, well, they're, they're heavy in general. They're much heavier than the gravitons and the diliton. So let's write down an effective action for those heavy degrees of freedom integrating out the light degrees of freedom. Okay, so it's a little bit like a Born-Oppenheimer um, approximation. Well, they, anything with mass interacts with other things with mass. Uh, so, yes, be careful. I mean... The interactions can balance so that you have a zero force condition, but they certainly are exchanging gravitons and so on. That's right. So, um, so this would be the action. If you, if you, now, I have to say, there's a classical effective field theory calculation to do here, which I haven't done carefully. But to extract the terms that I've written here, you don't need to do a full calculation. Let me just say, um, so... Supposing we take our n parallel brains, we make them, so we, sorry, we take our n brains, they're extended in these well volume directions, so we make them parallel to each other, and then they share a transverse space of dimension n. So they live in Rn, and there are n of them, so we label the, or we, we can then parameterize their positions, the way they're embedded into this space time, by some scalars, and because they're parallel, we just have these scalars, which are like, fields valued in Rn uh, valued over the world volume directions, this, this common world volume directions, 1 plus p. Okay. So then if we write down an action for these, if there was no interaction, if we ignored the exchange of gravitons and dilatons and so on, you would just get this term to leading order. So you just have the, you know, the integral over the world volume and the action, you have their tension or you know, this mu, and then you have um, some derivatives controlling, basically, you know, basically their objects with tension, and so this is their um, this is their action. Where this, I should say, is these are contracted just with the Minkowski metric. The world volume is just flat, <coughs> so they're just living in flat space, uh, flat min, ten di or d-dimensional Minkowski space. So now. <coughs> 
Now, that's not quite true, because, of course, um, what I've actually assumed, if to get that, is that the, the curvature of the objects is small as well. And so that simplifies this kinetic term like this. So think of a particle in general relativity just moving in Minkowski space. The kinetic term isn't uh, x dot squared. It's more complicated. It's the, you know, it's the pullback of the metric on the world line of the particle. But it's basically, yeah, it's basically root. Uh, you know, it's the, the action is the integral along the world line of the particle. Um, However, in the non-relativistic limit, where velocities are small, it just becomes x dot squared. And so that's what we're doing here. We're taking the non-relativistic limit for brains, if you like, which is like saying the gradient of their uh, moduli where they are is small. Remember, phi has dimensions of space. It's a, it tells you where they're embedded, so d phi is dimensionless. If you took the case of p is 0, this would exactly be telling you just v was small. So I'm working in this assumption. And now, so that's the kinetics term. So this is just analogous to x dot squared for p is 0. But now there's this, uh, we've, we've, they're exchanging gravitons, and we just, because they're slowly moving, that exchange happens very quickly. We can integrate out uh, the graviton exchange and get an effective action for these heavy brains. And the action you get looks like this. So if this was normal gravity, and these were just normal particles, we would have our x dot squared term, and then we would have a Newtonian potential interaction, which would just be mu squared kappa squared divided by 4 pi times the relative separation. And you would sum that over all pairs of particles. Okay? And so the structure of this is very similar. Mu squared kappa squared divided by the separation. So the separation here is the dis relative displacement in the transverse space. To the n minus 2, so 1 over r, what is 1 over r? When you talk about Newtonian potentials, 1 over 4 pi r is the uh, harmonic function in three dimensions. And so the analogous thing here is 1 over the sphere volume, an n minus 1 sphere, times relative separation to the n minus 2 if you're in n dimensions. Okay? So this is mu squared kappa squared. That sphere volume and that is just totally analogous to what you get for normal Newtonian gravitational exchange. Um, and the only tricky bit, or the, the main tricky bit, is this stuff here, which is telling you it's arising because whilst um, in normal gravity you have a potential interaction, gives rise to a potential, and we know that because if you've got two particles, um, they always attract each other. You can't keep them there. You can't have them sitting there unless you apply a force. Now, in supersymmetry, that's not true. The supersymmetry is very special, and it tells you that actually you can put these brains wherever you like in the transverse space, and provided they don't move, provided the phi's are constant in, in, in the world volume, that's a vacuum solution. And that arises because of cancellations between the various exchange of gravitons and scalars and so on. And it gives you, when you look at it, this derivative structure also in the interaction. So if this was a point particle, this would be like, this would be saying, so if these were point particles, we'd have our kinetic term mu um, v squared plus a sum over pairs mu squared kappa squared, and it's a v to the 4 over 4 pi r, where r, well, let me say r a minus r b, and this is really, I should have been a bit more careful, this is v a minus v b to the 4. Okay. And, oh, sorry, this was in, uh, if I'm in d equals 4. So particles in d equals 4 would look like this. So the, the big change over the Newtonian potential is this velocity to the 4 part. Okay. No, oh, no, 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 not at all. These phi's are functions of the world volume coordinates. They're fields. So they're precisely not rigid. They're, these fields are precisely describing the degrees of freedom of the brain. And so they have kinetic energy precisely because as they bend, it costs them energy to do that. Okay. 
So, in fact, uh, if you did the classical effective field theory calculation, which I haven't done, so I can't, this is, but I believe it's, it's obvious, if you think about post-Newtonian expansion in GR, uh, if you think about a particle in GR, you get a Newtonian interaction, but then you get higher order corrections in an expansion in kappa squared, and depending on what you expand in, there are certainly other terms. And here would be the same. So if, if I've got these multiple brains, if this is their positions in the transverse space, this first term that I wrote down is arising from graviton exchange between pairs of brains. But you would also expect graviton interactions involving three brains at a time at higher order in kappa. Okay. And you know, multiple graviton exchanges. <coughs> And so, in fact, uh, and I don't know what those terms look like in precise detail, but schematically, you can write down their form. Perhaps in the interest of time, I won't go over it here now. But uh, certainly, this is really the leading terms in an expansion in kappa squared, and there's an infinite number of terms. And I don't know anything about the ones beyond this one. So the... The black hole solutions in this supergravity that we're trying to provide a microscopic description of, and by the way, I should have emphasized, this is going to be the microscopic description of these things, where you take the number of brains, n, to be large. Um, it's, so we're supposed to be describing these black holes here. So if you write, you know, it's long been known, if you solve the equations, the supergravity equations, you can write down black holes uh, and they have some, these are the world volume coordinates, these are the transverse coordinates, there's a center, um, and this H is some harmonic function in Rn, which looks like this, and this would normally be like a charge, but I've written it in terms of the number of elementary charges you would need, N, uh, to make up that charge. And then F is just like in the Schwarzschild metric, this so-called uh, blackening factor, and it, it takes a very similar form. So ZH is the position of the horizon of the black hole. Okay. So if ZH is zero, note actually this solution is extremal. It's got zero temperature. This is the special thing. It's like extremal rise in Nordstrom. Um, but if ZH isn't zero, this thing has a finite temperature. You can see that because it breaks the Lorentz invariance in the world volume. Temperature breaks Lorentz invariance, picks out time. Okay. Now, you can take that solution, as was done long ago. You can compute its thermodynamics. It's using the standard prescriptions. And we, um, for reasons that I can't uh, explain but will just show you, the, the thermodynamics that we're interested in is not the general thermodynamics of this object, which, by the way, is asymptotically flat, because as you make Z very big, as you go away from the black holes, you just recover Minkowski space in D dimensions. So that's not the thermodynamics we're going to be interested in. These objects have this interesting thermodynamics, basically governed by the temperature, or ZH, and the charge, or N, two parameters, and in some limit uh, where the charge is small, what you're really seeing is a sort of thermodynamics of asymptotically flat um, black holes. But if you, turn, if you go to this decoupling limit, as you're told to do when you think about ADS-EFT or its generalizations, what you should do is you should take the charge to be very large and look at um, finite but small uh, energy excitations above extremality. And when you do that, the thermodynamic behavior simplifies a lot, because you had two parameters, but you're basically getting rid of one of them in that, in that limit, and it's a scaling limit. So there's still non-trivial dynamics there, um, but it becomes simpler. And the energy density then looks like this when you take that limit. And as you can see, it's some particular power of the horizon position, uh, zh to the n minus 2. And ZH can be written in terms of temperature in this way. 
So this isn't the general thermodynamics, this is the thermodynamics in this near extremal limit where you've got a big charge but you've got a finite energy. And um, again, there's violet in these expressions and what I'm going to try and convince you of in the next few slides is that it's actually easy to close your eyes a little bit and understand where the black bits of these expressions come from and I will have nothing to say about the violet bits um, but I think the violet bits are less interesting uh, or at least rather detailed. One thing is that of course this is only in the decoupling limit and you can ask what about corrections to the decoupling limit? What controls them? And what controls them if you look at the actual energy density uh, in, at a general uh, energy excitation above extremality, it goes like the decoupling one, plus corrections, where k is just some number, and the corrections are controlled by this parameter omega, which should be small in the decoupling limit. And so omega, again, has some particular form. And I, I have to say, I don't think any of these are particularly obvious. You know, if I said to you, is it obvious that uh, the energy, you know, ZH would be related to T in this way, probably it's just intuitive that you would write down the form of those expressions. Well, um, yeah, I mean, let's be careful. I mean, omega, of course, doesn't have dimensions. Uh, so, but you might argue that bit's obvious. Um, and ZH over kappa squared both have dimensions, so you can raise them to any power you like. So then, so then you say, well, it's, you know, it's to do with harmonic functions. And indeed, yeah, you, you certainly could do. Um, yeah. So, the, I mean, there's obvious bits of structure going in there. That's right. But I don't think, um, yeah. Let me, uh, so when you take this decoupling limit, as I, as I was alluding to before, the reason the dynamics isn't sort of trivial is that there's lots of structure near the horizon of the black hole. And as you're possibly familiar with or may have seen, it sort of corresponds, at the decoupling limit, co corresponds to taking large charge basically means you can drop that one, that one becomes irrelevant, and you also have to make sure that whilst that one has become irrelevant, you scale your, you make sure your ZH is in an appropriate range so that you haven't lost the one here as well. Um, and then when you do that, uh, the metric effectively the people down near the horizon looks like this. But what I want to say here is that there are two important bits of the metric. This bit, the sort of world volume bit, and a transverse bit. So let's call them the brain and transverse metrics. And they control, if you put a little brain, what do they mean to a brain? Well, what they mean to a brain is if you put another little brain as a probe, probing the geometry, the tension term of its action would be governed by these two metrics. So if you put a brain in at a position Z and then made it flex, its action would be governed by these two metrics. And the important thing there is to say that ZH, you might think, well, ZH is a coordinate. What does it physically mean? What it's physically telling you about is the size of this sphere in the transverse space at the horizon. And this metric here, I mean, it's got this factor out the front, but actually what brains care about is this metric, not this whole Einstein metric. So it's this bit. So ZH is actually telling you about the size of the horizon in the metric measured by the brains. So why is that important? Well, we'll come on to that shortly. So now we're set up. I can try and argue the forms of these expressions from this microscopic theory. So... What we're going to do is say, we've got this microscopic theory, we're going to put it at finite temperature. So I remind you, there it is. And we're going to assume that at finite temperature there's some sensible, virialized, thermodynamic state. Okay. And in particular, because the thing is virialized, it tells us the relation between the VEV of this term and the VEV of this term. which will look like this. So we'll have a relation between this and this. This is the virial theorem. And in particular, or in fact, one can think of it as a, an artifact, a sort of ward identity associated to scaling. 
And you could even write down the constant here. As you know, with the virial theorem, it depends on the scaling dimension of these terms in the Lagrangian. But I'm not going to be worried about numerical factors like a half or n, as you'll see. So let's just put a twiddle. But roughly, these should be parametrically the same order. And then the confusing thing is that whilst I've just told you I'm not interested in numerical factors, I'm going to carry along this factor of omega. So you can judge how sensible that is to do at the end of the talk. If we wanted to then estimate parametrically what the energy density of the system is, we would say, OK, well, given that these two terms are of the same order, it's, uh, and the energy density you would normally associate to be like the kinetic energy, uh, so the energy density should also be of the same parametric order as these terms. Okay, now we do something very, very naive. And here's what we do. We say, it's some bound state. It's got some probably very complicated dynamics, although we only care about some very crude features. So let's say um, all of the positions of the brains, their fields over the world volume, but let's say there's some parametric scale that controls them, all of them, and it's basically some scale which I'll just call capital Phi. And I'm also going to say that the, the relative separations of all brains is just the same scale. Parametrically, uh, it's going, I'm going to estimate it as the same scale. And I'm going to do likewise for derivatives. I'm going to say, OK, well, I don't know what the derivatives are, but I'm going to assume I can estimate them all as being the same, uh, uh, governed by some scale d phi, and likewise for their differences. And then at large n, I'm going to say that these sums go like n, and sum over pairs of interactions go like n squared. And then I'm going to make a, a, a sort of key step. And the key step is to say that, remember ZH, what did it do? It measured the horizon radius of the black hole in the metric natural to the brains. And so given these scalars phi, in this, in this effective theory, are telling you the positions of the brains in their transverse space. That's what they were originally. It seems natural to say that ZH should be related to the VEV of the scalars. Okay, so in particular, I'm going to say ZH just goes like this scale phi. That's what, I mean, you could write down this operator and take its VEV formally, but if you estimate this, as I've just told you, you would just get phi. And perhaps more surprisingly, I'm telling you that Parametrically, this should be true, but also I'm going to claim it's true if you include factors of pi and sphere volumes. There are no factors of pi's and sphere volumes in this relation. I mean, so... Well, oh, so there are n of these. If you want to write down something that has all the symmetries, you would naturally sum over all of them and then take the average. So the n's just cancel, that's right. Okay, so let's proceed then. So energy density is like this kinetic term. This kinetic term, well, let's forget the factor of 2 there, because we're not going to care about that. We've just got mu. We've got a sum over n things, so we put an n in. And then we've got this vev, but we just said we're basically going to estimate this by d, this scale d phi squared. Okay. And um, we also have that this should be of order the interaction term. And we estimate that. Well, these factors are just here. We've got a sum over pairs, so that's n squared. This uh, harmonic sort of separate, the bit of the harmonic function from separation just becomes a phi to the n minus 2. And then we've got four derivatives schematically. There's some Lorentz structure, but we're not worried about that. We've got four derivatives, our d4, uh, d phi to the 4 there. And then because these are supposed to be the same, we parametrically, we just relate this to this, and we get this relation. And then that tells us how the scale controlling derivatives is related to the scale controlling the size of the bound state. And then we can plug that back into here, for example, to get the energy density as a function of phi. So it sounds like a reasonable thing to do. And so when you do that, um, you, when you plug that back in, you get this. And this is supposed to look, well, under the identification that, remember, phi was telling us about the size of the bound state, which we thought should be the size of the horizon, if it corresponds to anything. Um, indeed, if you look at the supergravity results I gave you before and this, they indeed look similar up to the violet bits. 
So, because phi was the scale of the scalars. It was not only the scale of the separation of the brains, but it was also the scale of the size of the whole cluster. So I said, so I said, um, you know, if I have a VEV of this, I would replace it by phi, but also for the separations. So what it's saying, I suppose, uh, it's not saying anything very precise, but what it, I guess physically you are saying, there isn't substructure. So it's not like you have a bound state of this size, but all the brains have uh, average separations like this. You know, they're all just all over the place, and there's no special substructure. There's just one scale that control, controls everything, parametrically at least. Um, okay, so then you could say, well, okay, fine. If that's true, you can do a lot better than this. You've written down a classical theory. At least in the case of P is zero, it's just a, a me mechanics model. Why don't you go and do an n-body simulation, simulate bound states, assuming they exist, and you should not only reproduce this crude behavior, but you should probably, if you think about it carefully, get this factor of n over 4. And that would be a very reasonable thing to say. So why are you waving your hands? And the reason I'm waving my hands is because there were all of these higher corrections from these multi-exchanges. And when you think about estimating them, I mean, I think we, we understand what roughly the form they should have are, and in certain cases, like they've been calculated um, from uh, two graviton exchanges. Um, we understand the form, but when you estimate them, what you get is basically the kinetic term uh, so if it's an L graviton exchange, you get some factor to the L, and that factor is precisely um, uh, this relation here. So by which I mean the condition that the kinetic term is the same parametrically as the first interaction term is the same condition that all of these terms are exactly the same parametric order. So it doesn't make sense to truncate it at the first interaction level, you should really include them all. That's the claim. It doesn't change anything I've said. You could include them all and say, I want them, you know, do the same virilization uh, argument with all of them. It wouldn't change anything I've said because it's exactly the same scale that controls the relative separation of them all. Uh, but it does mean that because it's strongly coupled, you don't have control to go and do a, a straightforward calculation. Okay. So it's not a trivial theory. It's a strongly coupled theory, in it, uh, if you want to be sort of self-consistent. Let me go a bit further. So uh, I'm, I'm almost, or I can be almost done, so don't worry. <laughs> you can uh, phrase it a different way. You can phrase it so that the, um, the virial theorem comes from a scaling symmetry. Uh, it comes from basically the ward identity associated to scaling fields. And so you can still do that when you've got an infinite number of terms. And then what it does is it relates the VEV of the sum of all of them. So with the virial theorem, you can think of as uh, it relates the VEV of the sum of the terms to some number, say, 0. Right, so you take one on one side and the other side, and you get a relation between the two. If you've got an infinite number of them, it tells you that the sum of all of them is related to some number, say, 0. And then um, the natural thing to say is that... Um, so it gives you a constraint on all of them. And then the most natural thing to say is they're all of the same order. And they all can be of the same order. I mean, it's not obvious they could all be of the same order, but they all can be of the same order. Um, so you could either say, it, it, you know, I suppose you've got two terms, you would say virial theorem. If you've got an infinite number of terms, you say the strong coupling scale. Um, you could still, yeah, you can still get a... a, a anyway, let me not say more. So... Um, now let's consider temperature. So we've got this scale d phi that uh, can we do better with that? And the point is, the argument is going to be this. Yes, we're going to estimate our scale d phi as just temperature times phi. So, okay, so 
fine. On dimensional grounds, temperature has units of uh, inverse length, so that's great. That looks right on dimensional grounds. But there are other scales around that have units of temperature. For example, this thing. What has, uh, uh, yes, certainly has the right units to, to put in there. So why on earth would you just use temperature? And the reason you would just use temperature is that the whole point about this theory is it has some interesting infrared scaling dynamics. And if you've got a theory with infra interesting infrared scaling dynamics, it may have some fundamental energy scales in. But if you go to very low energies, you should lose sensitivity to those fundamental scales. And then the only scale at very low temperatures that you have, if you have non-trivial dynamics there, will be temperature. So if you have a theory, uh, some complicated quantum field theory, and it flows through an infrared fixed point that's a conformal theory, derivatives in that theory should just be controlled by temperature. Right? There, there aren't other dimensional scales. Now, this obviously isn't true. If you take quantum mechanics, it doesn't have interesting infrared physics because it's got a mass gap in general, I should say. So take the harmonic oscillator. You have a mass gap. So you don't have anything like this. So this certainly wouldn't work for the harmonic oscillator. But this is a very different sort of system, evidently. Um, um, sorry, so what's... No, I'm just, talk I'm just saying there's an I interesting scaling behavior. There's interesting dynamics. I'm not saying it's conformal. There's just some scaling dynamics. So you don't have a mass gap. You can take the temperature to very low temperatures, and there's some scaling of parameters. It's not that, you know, with, when you have a mass gap below the scale of the gap, it, the, the dynamics is trivially controlled by the first excited state and the ground state, but basically the ground state. And there's no interesting dynamics. Anyway, let me just... Um, get through this. So, so if you make this, now the other sort of trick is if we're going to try and keep track of sphere volumes or essentially factors of pi, um, then really T isn't the right thing. If you think about a Matsubara decomposition, say, in Euclidean time, T's always come along with two pi's. So two's we don't care about, but pi's we should be careful of. So really we should have a pi T here. So recall we had this relation from our very old estimate or a strong coupling estimate. We have this, goes like this. And then we say, well, this, d phi, is pi t phi. And then I can solve phi from this and get it as a function of t. And in supergravity, this was the expression we had. And here, this is the expression we have. And recall that we're claiming that phi just measures the size of the black hole and should be identified by with zh. Yes, this one. No, no, no. No, there's some factor here, n minus 2. So, so now with this simple estimate, we re reproduce this, which recovers this with this factors, not including the violet. OK? And again, uh, so if the energy one was a bit too simple and, I mean, the form of this, I have no idea how you deduce just by thinking about it. So, there's one more thing. We had assumed for consistency that these brains were sort of non-relativistic. They're slowly moving or slowly bending, weakly bending, um, requiring that to be small. Now, that we can check self-consistently whether it's true or not. So, that we estimate as d phi squared, which we, I told you what it was, uh, or claimed what it was. And then we know phi in terms of t, so we get this. And so this consistency condition that we started with uh, tells us that we should believe that, you know, we should only believe our arguments if this is true. And I also told you from supergravity, you know that the actual energy isn't really the decoupling energy. There are corrections to it when you go away from the decoupling limit. And this parameter, omega, is precisely the same thing, the thing that controls that limit. So again, um, the fact that we had assumed this tells you this condition, which you also had in the gravity. Exactly the same thing, with all the right factors. 
There's one other thing I, I understand. I'm, could I have two more minutes? One other nice thing. Uh, this is a beautiful thing, and I kicked myself for not realizing this earlier because it's so trivially simple when you think about it. You can ask, suppose if we've got this complicated, in the transverse space we've got this, what I guess I call, well, we call them the paper of soup because it's not too warm and it's strongly interacting, uh, just like soup, or the best soups. Um, now, you could ask, I mean, we've been discussing the sort of thermodynamics of this, but you could then ask, supposing I take a brain a long way away, can you recover a picture for how you understand the potential that this sees due to the presence of this black hole? So that would arise... Remember, we have terms like this in a Lagrangian. So if you, take, if you consider taking one of your moduli and putting it far outside of this bound state, it will arise from pairwise interactions with all of the, uh, brain, uh, you know, the, the moduli in here. And so if you think about the, the interaction potential will come from a term like this. coming from, So the number of pairs that you would sum over just goes like n, because there will be n pairs linking to this one, you'll get a mu kappa squared, um, you get a sphere volume, sorry, mu squared kappa squared sphere volume, and then you get a velocity to the 4 over r to the n minus 2. Now, if you take this object to be very far away, say r is much bigger than the radius of this object, zh, then this power on the bottom will just be dominated by r, so you get a 1 over r to the n minus 2. Now here's the bit that I think is sort of interesting. If this was at zero temperature, they'd all be still. That's a vacuum state in the supersymmetric theory. And then there would be no potential generated. Again, it's a vacuum state if he's sitting still. However, if these are moving, this is at finite temperature, if these are moving, then you do have relative velocities between this and the constituents. And that relative velocity isn't coming from the velocity of this. It's coming from the velocity of the stuff in here. So that is just estimated by our scale d phi squared that we had before. Okay. And so that would be, that's the claim for how you would understand the gravitational potential for a, a, a black hole far away. So I think that's, I hope that's what I wrote down here. Oh, sorry, to the four. It's to the four, not squared. <clears throat> and uh, so that's the energy of this, uh, the, the interaction energy here. This is the energy that we wrote down before for this blob. So we can then write the energy of this probe particle in terms of, we can eliminate d phi in terms of the energy density of the blob and these other things. And when you do the calculation in gravity, in supergravity, which is simple to do, um, you get this answer. And it, it precisely agrees with all the factors again. So in particular, it goes like energy density squared. This is to the 4, this is squared. So it goes like energy density to the squared over r to the n minus 2, da, 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 da. You might say, why does it go like energy density squared? It wouldn't if you were in the asymptotically flat case, but in the decoupled region, it, for, some, for reasons I don't intuitively understand, it goes like energy density squared. So it's sort of... This is already slightly, I mean, not obvious, but anyway, it's, I think it's nice that there's a simple picture for how to recover it. Now, anyway, I'm over time, so I won't tell you any more about Super Young Mills, except to say um, you can derive this moduli theory, you can think about it as coming from gravity, or you can derive it in a precise manner from Yang Mills theory. These Yang Mills theories have a classical moduli space. The fields we wrote down are the moduli of that moduli space. And there's a systematic way of generating terms in this action from the Yang-Mills. And that's one of the bases of why people believe gauge gravity duality in the first place. So there's nothing new there. It's a beautiful and very old story. The point now being that if once you understand that that is there anyway, that's the basis of gauge gravity duality in some sense, it's very natural then, it seems to me, that when you put the thing at finite temperature, you should recover the thermodynamics of black holes and the behavior of black holes. Because I've just shown you that that moduli theory seems to very naturally encode, that effective theory seems to very naturally encode, um, although it's strongly coupled, it's very natural to see how the dynamics of black holes can arise. So anyway, that's...
That's the punchline, I suppose. So, sorry for going over. Yes, absolutely.